Good evening, everyone. My name is Paul Grady, and I'm the co-director of the Centre for Applied Human Rights at the University of York. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to our 2023 annual York Human Rights City Lecture. We're delighted to have attendees from the City of York, but also from other parts of the UK, and indeed we have some international registrations. The lecture is part of the University of York Open Lecture Series. We're grateful to the university events and audiovisual teams for their support. I have a few administrative matters to cover at the outset. In English captions has been enabled, and if you can't see those on your screen, there should be a button at the bottom of your screen that you can click on in order to see English captions. There's also a BSL translator, British Sign Language Translator, and we welcome and thank Jenny Manning for providing that translation tonight. The talk is being recorded, uh, and with Gert's permission, we will circulate uh, this talk through our networks after the event itself. And finally, there's a Q&A session at the end of Gert's talk. You won't be able to ask your questions uh, in person, uh, but there should again be a tab at the bottom of your screen titled Q&A where you can list your questions. You can also push those questions up the priority list by voting for them if you particularly like a question, um, in addition perhaps to asking your own. Please do put questions in the Q&A box as Gert is talking so the moderators have questions to work with once he's finished. The event is organized by the York Human Rights City Network. The network is a civil society led network co-hosted by the Center for Applied Human Rights at the University of York and York CVS, the Center for Voluntary Service. The network was formed in 2011 and drove the campaign for York to become the UK's first human rights city in 2017. Against a backdrop of rising populism, austerity, and a polarized debate about human rights within the UK, we secured the backing of all the main political parties in York for the declaration, as well as widespread support from civil society, faith groups, and beyond. It's important to note that the declaration marked, and I quote, an ambition a significant point in a journey, not a destination. So it was an indication of intent and a feeling that there was widely shared intent across the city to realize the potential of human rights within York. We host an annual lecture to coincide with the anniversary of the declaration and to reflect upon progress made on this journey. One measure of progress made is that we publish an annual indicator report, and we are about to publish that report for 2022, the seventh report that the network will have published. And it focuses mainly on priority rights selected by the people of York themselves. Those are equality and non-discrimination, education, health and social care, housing, and a decent standard of living. We also cover other human rights related issues and developments within the city. In terms of progress this year, we're pleased to mark the continued fall of young people, those aged 16 and 17, who are um, not in education, employment and training. So fewer people fall within that category and that we've seen a continued decline of that category over a number of years. We also highlight the impressive efforts to welcome refugees within the city and the important ongoing work of the Poverty Truth Commission. With reference to challenges, the report documents the early effects of the cost of living crisis within the city. These include a very large increase in food bank use. The gender pay gap is another issue of concern and has been for a number of years. It continues to rise and in York is double the national average. 
We also highlight concerns about digital exclusion as public service and welfare provision, particularly after COVID-19, has shifted largely online. And we repeat the network's dismay at the exclusion of blue badge holders from the city center and our support for the Reverse the Ban Coalition, an extraordinary coalition led by disabled people and disability groups seeking, as its name suggests, to reverse the exclusion and ban from the city center. So one window on our progress, the indicator report indicates that the journey for York to, be, to fulfill the potential of being a human rights city is far from complete. We've made progress in some areas, but much remains to be done. Against this backdrop, I would like to welcome tonight's speaker. Professor Gert Oberleitner is the UNESCO Chair in Human Rights and Human Security, the Professor of International Law, and the Director of the European Training and Research Center for Human Rights and Democracy, all at the University of Graz in Austria. By anyone's reckoning, this is a very impressive list of titles. Graz holds a special place in York's development as a human rights city. Graz became Europe's first human rights city in February 2001. And when we were looking to make our own declaration, we reached out to draw on their experience. Thomas Rajakovic represented the mayor of Graz and attended our declaration event in York. Thomas met with civil society and council staff, and those meetings significantly shaped plans within the city after our own declaration. It's no exaggeration to say that Graz as a city and Goethe as an individual have been crucial in developing the thinking and practice of human rights cities in Europe and beyond. I want to highlight in particular the role of the annual events that they host and the publications that they produce based on those events under the title of Human Rights Go Local, What Works? These have become a kind of think tank for human rights policy and practice. Gert has been instrumental in organizing these events in his capacity as co-director of the International Center for the Protection of Human Rights at the local and regional levels and as a UNESCO chair. These events and associated publications have looked at important challenges facing human rights cities, such as how to link cities to global frameworks, such as the UN Human Rights Treaties and Sustainable Development Goals, how to move from intentions to concrete implementation, and finally, how to govern a city using human rights principles and objectives. Gert's research interests extend beyond human rights cities to include global human rights institutions, the law of armed conflict, and intersections between peace and security. Gert, it is a great pleasure to welcome you to give our annual human rights lecture titled this year, Human Rights Go Local, Mobilizing the Potential of Human Rights Cities in Europe. Over to you. Thank you very much, Paul. Thank you very much for this very kind introduction and your kind words on the work that we are doing here. It's a wonderful opportunity uh, to reconnect again. Uh, thank you for the invitation to deliver this uh, prestigious York Human Rights City Network lecture, uh, something we already can learn from York because we do not have such a fantastic event here. It's a great pleasure to be here with you, even though it is just online. Uh, thank you also very much to the Center for Applied Human Rights at York for the continued cooperation that we have, particularly uh, to your team, Oliver Harris, Claire Fox, for organizing uh, and making this event possible. Uh, my thanks also go to the City of York. Um, we are connected, as Paul has rightly said, as two human rights cities, sharing a very similar outlook and perspective. 
and let me also take this opportunity, Paul, personally to congratulate you to the recent establishment of the UNESCO chair in the protection of human rights defenders and expansion of political space launched only a few weeks ago. It is hard to think of any more timely and valuable contribution uh, to these troubled times for human rights defenders and shrinking civil space. I'm sure this will make a much needed contribution and I uh, bring my best wishes and extend the hope that we will cooperate in this also further. I'm, as Paul has mentioned, speaking to you, of course, first and foremost in my capacity as UNESCO chair, so I speak to you as a professor working at uh, an academic environment, but also, as Paul has kindly mentioned, I co-direct the uh, UNESCO Center for the Promotion of Human Rights at the local and regional level, um, I think, which is still one of its kind research institutions trying to come to terms with uh, the demands uh, that uh, the move of human rights to the local level have created. Um, we have emerged out of the understanding that human rights at the local level need this support, need supporting research, capacity building, and networking. And uh, Paul was kind enough already to mention our flagship initiative, the annual academy and conference on human rights for local world works. And it's up to me to extend a cordial invitations to you uh, also to participate in this event, which usually takes place in February each year. Um, we hope very much that uh, this will be of interest for you. The Academy produces an outcome document that is given to a high level conference for policymakers, um, city administrators, representatives of international organizations, civil society. Uh, and uh, we saw more than 400 participants this year uh, from 55 countries. And I'm mentioning this because my hope is that I will meet you there next at our uh, conference and academy. And you are most welcome. And I'm, of course, happy also to give more examples also of the work of this institution in the discussion uh, and extend already here an invitation to cooperate with anyone interested. And, and finally, as, as Paul mentioned, I'm, of course, speaking to you as a resident of the human rights city of Graz. We usually proudly proclaim to have been the first one in Europe um, uh, when uh, the city agreed that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights should be the basis for the city's policies and actions. With that, we are indeed in a position to look back uh, at more than 20 years of experience as a human rights city. Um, and uh, I'm far from claiming that this is uh, only a success story and that we not wish to glorify um, what has happened, but I'm happy to share thoughts and experiences with you also on the progress the city has made on the achievements and the shortcomings as one of the many examples of a human rights city uh, worldwide here in Graz. But I've been invited to speak to you on how human rights go local more broadly and what it means to mobilize the potential of human rights at the local level. So let me use this opportunity today to reflect a bit with you on how human rights went local and how the idea of human rights at the local level emerged and became to be what I think can be called the human rights cities movement. Let me ask what human rights cities are and what they are for, and let me flag some expectations, some successes, some setbacks, some lessons learned over the years, and some critical questions to be considered for the future development of this new movement. It's also good to speak to you uh, on this topic in this particular moment in time when we commemorate the 75th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the founding document of all that we do. Because as you may well know, it was uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, uh, wife of the US president and first chairperson of the UN Human Rights Commission, who said the famous word that where, after all, do universal human rights begin in small places close to home? And unless these rights have meaning there, they have little meaning anywhere. So the 75th uh, uh, anniversary of the Universal Declaration, I think, is also an opportunity to reassess whether human rights cities live up to that claim uh, more than three centuries, more than three quarters of a century ago. Uh, it also means we are looking back at 
nearly 25 years, more than 25 years of the very idea of human rights cities emerging when the city of Rosario in Argentina in 1979 declared itself the first such human rights cities. Um, so perhaps this is also an occasion to celebrate and to look, to look back. Indeed, the, the idea of local human rights was not alien to the Universal Declaration, as is often thought. Yes, it is a document that speaks about universality, but it is not a document creating state obligations. It speaks to all members of the human family living together in community. And Eleanor Roosevelt rightly translated this need to understand human rights, not just as distance or abstract concepts, but as relevant in communities. But it did take well into the 1990s that the specific role of cities for human rights was actually discovered. And I think there were three interconnected forces that came together and that are still with us and that need to be recognized um, that allowed this to happen. One is that the idea of human rights cities is firmly rooted in the idea of the importance of human rights education. The right to know your right uh, is at the basis of the very idea. Um, which can also be found in the UN decade on human rights education and action plans, and pave the way that the hope is not only generating knowledge in human rights, but creating a culture of human rights as a personally lived experience that has to unfold necessarily on the local level. The second trend was um, that the 1990s so a turn from rhetoric or standard setting to realization. From rhetoric to reality was the slogan in many of the books and talks at that time. And with so many shortcomings discovered in state's will and ability to realize human rights, there was a turn to the state subunits, to the cities and to local places. And this was thirdly fostered by a well-recognized trend that the future will be in cities with an ever larger percentage of people living in urban areas, the growth of cities became to be understood as a problem and a solution alike, where, if not in cities, should human rights be realized. These three interconnected trends, ownership of human rights through human rights education, uh, changing rights from abstract principles to lived realities, and the growing importance of urban politics as drivers of societal and global change enabled the emergence of the idea of human rights and Rosario in Argentina was the first one to jump on the bandwagon when more than 100 people came together in the city hall and signed the proclamation that made Rosario a human rights sensitive city. And soon after, from the 2000s onwards, other initiatives and cities followed suit. Uh, the European Charter for the Safeguarding of Human Rights in the City was adopted in 2000. In 2001, the South Korean city of Guangzhou became a human rights city, establishing the annual World Human Rights Cities Forum. And cities in many re regions followed, Timbuktu in Mali, Nagpur in India, Nuremberg in Germany, Winnipeg in Canada, Barcelona, which saw a gathering of 400 local authorities in 1998 in the Conference Cities for Human Rights. York in 2017, where we have been privileged to uh, work together with you, as Paul had already mentioned. So what you can see is that this period from 2000 on, I think, signified a clear move away from a focus on national governments, which had characterized the 1980s and 1990s towards responsibility for human rights at the local level, and also a change from isolated initiatives to what I think has by now become a movement. But what makes a human rights city? There is, you will know, no single answer. Um, some cities, some human rights cities, emerge more from a normative concept or from a normative basis, rooting city administrations and global governance in human rights law, norms, principles, first and foremost, the Universal Declaration, or self-created human rights obligations. Other cities have been strong in emphasizing the city's agency in thematic matters related to human rights, 
um, highlighting topics such as inclusion or anti-racism or tolerance or peace or sustainability, and yet others see and foreground sociological processes and argue for cities as living and learning organisms um, that um, uh, employ not the laws, but the language, the literacy, the artistry of human rights for local policy making and society progress. As a consequence, and this will not surprise you, I have no list of human rights cities for you, which would always be a good start for a talk on human rights cities. How many are there? Well, there is none that would be authoritative enough to include cities or exclude cities. Nobody keeps a register, nobody hands out titles, you know, membership cards. And at this moment in time, a debate is going on whether there should be some form of accreditation or evaluation for human rights cities, a topic which you might want to follow up in the discussion, perhaps. To me, it seems good that nothing like this exists. Um, it means also I cannot tell you how many human rights cities there are. I can only refer you to a campaign which is run by United Cities and Local Governments, UCLG, an organization that uh, brings together many cities, uh, running a campaign which is called 10, 100, 1000 Human Rights Cities by 2023, which gives you an idea. And is meant to stimulate the growth of human rights cities. I also don't know what the latest addition to the list of human rights cities is. My guess, but I stand to be corrected, is perhaps Swansea, February 2023. But I might be wrong on that because others might already have joined this movement. So in essence, and in the absence of clear-cut criteria, I think a human rights city is, is all of that. It is a normative, an institutional and sociological setup where human rights guide policymaking, governance and community life, where institutions are constructed in a human rights-based approach with the view towards protecting, promoting, fulfilling human rights of individuals who are themselves put at the center and empowered to participate. And when I say human rights here, I mean, of course, international human rights law, but I mean also to mention the strong links that are increasingly discovered between local human rights concerns and the 2030 agenda of UN with uh, the sustainable development goals. Um, the concept of leaving no one behind uh, in line with the UN SDGs is a very strong driver for many human rights initiatives on the local level and SDG 11 itself uh, on inclusive, safe, resilient and sustainable cities is closely linked to human rights. Another topic to be discussed, what is that linkage of the SDGs and human rights on the local level? And do they support each other as we usually think they do and they should? Uh, guidance on the construction of human rights can be found now in very different frameworks. And these frameworks demonstrate that there is a consolidation of the human rights cities idea away from being isolated activisms of overly ambitious mayors or engaged citizens towards uh, a movement that comes with its own uh, framework. Uh, the European Charter for the Safeguarding of Human Rights in the City of 2010, or the Global Charter Agenda of Human Rights in the City of 2011, or the Guangzhou Guiding Principles on Human Rights Cities 2014 just to mention the most prominent ones. Um, the Swedish platform for policy and operational development of human rights at the local and regional level of 2019 as a wonderful blueprint. And most recently, our colleagues at the Finnish city of Turku has done us a great favor because they have just a few weeks ago published a paper on how to become a human rights city which is based on a qualitative comparison of different cities' activities in the establishment and move towards being a human rights city. What does this mean in practice? In practice, it means, I think, that human rights can understood on the local level and are understood on the local level 
as design choices, for local policy and decision making, for designing strategies, policies, projects in a human rights based approach. And I think this is the strength. Say you are planning a new bus line or tram line. Is that process guided? And is it guided, first of all, by human rights considerations? Are the most vulnerable and disadvantaged areas being connected or are they not? Will women feel safe with the lightning design of the stations or will they not? Is the digital ticketing system acceptable for all, including for the elderly? And are technical and budgetary considerations based on such human rights concerns? Or is it rather um, the other way around? Um, so in essence, I think, and turning to some of the expectations that come with the structure and the potential and limits of the human rights cities idea, the prime expectation of human rights cities, at least if seen from the perspective of international human rights law, is the more effective realization of human rights from the perspective of cities. It, it is perhaps the idea to make a city, the city a better place to live and better being understood as enjoying human rights or enjoying human rights for all uh, to a greater extent. Which is of course quite an expectation and as an expectation perhaps prone to be dashed, but it also rests on the underlying assumption that it is the proximity to people that allows local governments, uh, governments to have the greater ability to respond to needs and concerns and to position them better uh, to identify and address human rights violation. And in doing so, creating the kind of responsive, inclusive, equitable communities that prioritize the needs and rights of individuals over other considerations. So there is an output element that building human rights into local governance, policy making, decision making will have a human rights oriented outcome and an input element in which the participation of communities empowered citizens and individuals shapes and affects everyday lives. And all of this should and does apply in particular to those rights which are considered of primary importance on the local level, while at the same time being often underdeveloped on the national level, socioeconomic rights and cultural rights, and necessarily healthcare, education, housing, water supply, environment, cultural participation, and others are the issues at stake here. These are high expectations. Um, and in the absence of proven strategies, even after 25 years, I would say, cities and regions are still laboratories for testing and implementing innovative approaches to human rights. And by experimenting with such new policies and practices, cities and region develop or can develop more effective, perhaps even more efficient way to realize human rights. What have we learned over the past years? What kind of examples can we put together? I cannot be exhaustive at this point, but let me perhaps flag some ideas that are reoccurring and that drive and should drive the future development of human rights cities. I think first, it has become obvious that cities are not static or monolithic entities. Um, they need to be seen in their different functions and the human rights obligations and human rights possibilities need to be seen in these different functions. Be it as political arenas or democratic actors in which decision-making takes place uh, and where local governance needs to be based on human rights with all the associated challenges. But cities can also be welfare providers and public service providers for socioeconomic needs, which necessitates the uh, focus on socioeconomic and cultural rights that I have tried to mention. And cities may also be economic actors or business actors, uh, which leads you to a debate on business and human rights on the local level. So, the argument is function matters and function needs to be considered. I think, secondly, we have also learned that there are 
three elements you find in all human rights cities, and they need to be taken seriously. One is that each city starts with some form of commitment to human rights principles or human rights norms or human rights law. That could be a losing vocation of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, but that could also take more concrete forms. San Francisco is always mentioned as the prime example for more or less directly integrating UN convention uh, against uh, all forms of discrimination of women into its city ordinances. Um, the Parliament Act on the Flemish equal opportunity and equal treatment policy directly relies on the international convention on the elimination of all forms of racial discrimination. Um, the city of The Hague introduced the Child Rights Convention as basis for its youth policy. The city of Middelburg integrated the convention uh, on the rights of persons with disabilities, which again begs the question for our discussion. Does this mean that we see a move from rhetoric declarations of human rights principles towards more legally binding commitments? And what would be the consequences if there were such a move to be observed? Secondly, every human rights city has a structure in which human rights can unfold, responsible units or bodies at least the engagement of stakeholders. Um, Wing Arts is the Human Rights Advisor Report, where city administration, political parties, and civil society congregates. Flanders and Montreal have human rights ombudspersons. Vienna has a human rights office. Ontario has a human rights commission, which is important to ensure sustainability against changes in policy cycles. And thirdly, it needs tools and methods within these structures to support these structures, capacity building, communication, training, mainstreaming human rights and policies, action plans, evaluation mechanisms. There are many of those. I cannot even start counting them, but let me highlight two important elements that have come more and more to the forefront. One, and this was also something that we dealt with in the, the last academy here in Graz, is how do we include human rights, not just in local governance, but in local public management. And what are the tools and the means, uh, including issues such as human rights budgeting, to understand human rights as a management tool? Uh, it seems that Mexico City was the first city that tried human rights budgeting in 2009. Amsterdam still has a municipal uh, human rights category in its municipal budget, Barcelona, applies gender budgeting. So these are examples uh, that need to be explored. And second, and this is something I do not need to tell our friends in New York, is the importance of measuring and creating indicators and benchmarks for understanding the outcome of human rights. And uh, the York Human Rights City Network indicator reports that Paul just mentioned in the introduction are a prime example uh, and one of the most important uh, data sets to combine evidence-based data and qualitative case studies to assess progress and setbacks. So I think these three elements are structural elements you find in all human rights cities. Uh, let me also mention, however, one thing that emerges as a recurrent problem for human rights cities, and that is the way in which local human rights are rooted in multi-level governance structures and uh, the potential and problems that this brings. Some cities perceive themselves more as sub-state entities with limited or no autonomous competence, but working for the subsidiary implementation of national policies. Um, it is interesting to note, for example, that the most recent uh, statement by the UN Human Rights Council on the importance of human rights cities is very carefully worded by saying that human rights cities are only complementary to the state and not more. On the other hand, you have cities that start the human rights cities movement because of their frustration over national policies or governance, sometimes even in outright opposition. I just mentioned some Hungarian cities who act in opposition to the urban government. It is interesting to note that in Spain, for example, 
90% of the signatory cities of the European Charter for Safeguarding Human Rights in the City are Catalan cities with strong views on Catalan independence. The city of Utrecht has at some point considered unacceptable implementing the Aliens Act of 2000. And some Italian cities have outrightly refused to implement a national Italian decree on reducing access to social programs for asylum seekers. The place of cities in this multi-level governance structure remains as precarious as it does offer chances. One last point I would like to elaborate on is another effect of the human rights cities idea, and that is positioning cities as human rights actors on the global scene, allowing them to form coalitions and interact and build agency in defense of human rights. I would go as far as to say that with this, a new kind of human rights defender has actually entered the stage, at least the international and regional stage in human rights system. Um, as you may be aware, it was already in 2004 that UNESCO established the International Coalition of Cities Against Racism to help municipal leaders exchange ideas and improve policies in the fight against racism, discrimination, xenophobia, and exclusion. Um, the European Coalition of Cities Against Racism with more than 100 municipalities does similar things and has adopted one of the most important documents in the human rights cities movement, the 10 point action plan against racism. Uh, I would say that human rights cities are already transnational human rights actors. Um, they are not even just on the way, they, they, are, they are already uh, there. And these activities of human rights cities are also increasingly recognized on the international level, most prominently when uh, um, in 2015, the UN Human Rights Council um, uh, at an advisory committee report that was later accepted by the Human Rights Council, who recognized the role of local government in the promotion and protection of human rights together with the important functions of local government to provide public services that address local needs and priorities related to, to the realization of human rights at the local level. And there is increasing, but also challenging practice of human rights cities, for example, in the United Nations system. Um, for example, by reporting directly to UN bodies, the City of Ghent in Belgium in 2019 submitted the report on its efforts to promote human rights as part of the UN's universal periodic review process. Other cities begin to engage more directly with UN special procedures or treaty bodies, such as the city of Rosario, who engaged in a discussion on the right to education with the UN special rapporteur on the right to education. Other cities partner with UN agencies and UN programs. Uh, the city of Utrecht in the Netherlands has partnered with the UN Women Safe Cities and Safe Public Spaces program to address gender-based violence and promote gender equality. And some cities openly support UN-led initiatives, such as the city of Bonn, that in 2019 has adopted a resolution supporting the UN Global Compact for Migration. I think these are interesting examples of the past years, um, which demonstrate agency for human rights cities on the global scale. The future place of human rights cities uh, in the international human rights system needs yet to be carved out in detail. But it seems to me that human rights have become increasingly drivers of what one would call inclusive multilateralism and of global cooperation that goes beyond the nation state that includes various stakeholders to respond to complex challenges. And such a newfound urban agency raises, of course, a number of questions as to the future legal and political status of cities in the international arena. Let me be provocative. Should cities have legal authority to enter into international agreements or report to international body? or to engage with UN mechanisms formally? And what does that mean 
for the future of cities in the international system, in international law, and in international relations. Let me come to, to some conclusions that we, that we learn out of this broader bird's eye view of the human rights city movement of the past 25 years. I think we, we have come a long way to understand what it means to be a human rights city um, and what it requires to be a human rights city, what it means that human rights go local and what it requires that human rights go local. It does presuppose some commitment to become a human rights city that goes beyond minimum legal standards that is firmly rooted in the universality and interdependence of human rights that creates ever more specific obligations that necessitates an ever clearer understanding of the nature of the human rights based approach for local policies and practices and that understands human rights as what they are legal norms for the administrative area but also as communal values upon which communities can can build it does clearly and i think this is the example of all successful human rights cities sub require supporting and resource structures that enable participation and ensure sustainability beyond policy cycles or electoral cycles and it does need more emphasis on understanding assessment and evaluation to measure progress and setbacks and to allow for an evidence-based local human rights policy as one of the big future challenges um, to counter the critique of human rights as ideological or elitist projects that have no meaning for ordinary people. I've tried to demonstrate that there are some innovative tools and instruments um, with some diversity. And I think this diversity necessitates also more exchange of information and more coalition building. Perhaps it also puts a question mark on the future human rights cities movement that we imagine. Should it be one that is driven by creative diversity or should it be one that becomes more streamlined into a recognizable actor on the global scale with all the consequences. To me personally, and this is what I would like to conclude with, human rights cities are first and foremost a source of inspiration because they are innovative. They're innovative in a number of ways. They are innovative for their transnationalism and the way in which they give meaning that within universality, not only can there be relative relativity in, in some way, but subsidiarity as the better way to accommodate differences in universality. And in doing so, of course, the challenge the primacy of the nation state as the problem solver for global concerns. I think they're innovative for their pragmatic creativity in which they deal with human rights, because they very often do not see human rights as the problem or human rights violations as the problem, but see human rights and the use of human rights as the solution to problems on the local level. And they're innovative for the pluralist approaches and the diversity which they take because they can take due note of context and link that context with more participatory inclusive democratic processes. None of this comes without challenges. Um, it remains difficult to measure progress. It remains difficult to argue why a human rights city is a better place to live than a non-human rights city. There is a danger of labeling human rights cities for political purposes. The diversity of the patchwork of human rights cities also becomes an issue. But to me, the human rights cities movement is without doubt still a very productive, perhaps the most productive development in the history of human rights at the moment, um, because it allows for more pluralistic approaches to implement human rights than traditional approaches. And it moves away from the mere idea of human rights being in need of protection by the sovereign towards, and perhaps even overcoming the well-established triad of human rights protection, promotion, and fulfillment by the nation state 
what one may call enactment of human rights, living of human rights on the local level by local communities. And I think with all the challenges, that is of great value. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm very much looking forward to our discussion. Many thanks, Gert, for that um, really fantastic panoramic overview uh, and analysis of both some of the opportunities presented by human rights as an innovative actor on the international human rights scene, but also, I guess, some of the challenges that the movement, as you describe it, faces going, going forwards. Um, I, I would just like to say before handing over to the moderators of the, the Q&A that um, we have discussed um, hopefully bringing it to York at some point. The, this, the particular timing of this talk didn't seem particularly conducive <laughs> given, um, well, two things really. One, that we have an election uh, very soon, um, but also that in terms of the university term, lots of students are engaged in revision for exams. But we we very much, and really the, the talk Gert, has, has, I guess, further entrenched our desire to, to bring you to York uh, at some point soon, um, so that we can uh, further the collaboration that obviously we've had now for, for some time. I'd like to hand over now to uh, Marilyn Corshaw and Alison Simmons, who are also members of the York Human Rights City Network Executive, who will uh, moderate the Q&A session. Thank you, Paul. Um, we've only got a couple of questions so far, so please get your questions in and make, uh, make good use of Gert while he's here. So um, the first question is from Clara Chung. Uh, so thank you for the presentation. Um, she's got a question about a human rights city such as York and what the standing would be when it comes to a diplomatic relationship between the city of York and the People's Republic of China's cities under the rule of Chinese Communist Party, which is violating human rights within its territory, for example, slave labor or genocide. Um, Please note that York is twinned with um, a city in China, Nanjing. So um, how would that relationship be treated? Hopefully that makes sense. Gert? Um, do you want me to respond directly? And, yeah, yes, please. Um, yeah. uh, it makes a lot of sense, but it's a very challenging one, of course. Um, one, perhaps it, it's worth mentioning that some cities currently and in the last years are experimenting with conducting some kind of uh, foreign city, city foreign policy, if you wish. And um, I think the region of Flanders and perhaps other places have given themselves a more or less outlined document in which they um, sort of put forward their own political positions towards entities outside their own state and how they would uh, deal with, uh, with, uh, with uh, these other entities. So it is not impossible uh, in a policy framework for cities or regions, of course, to do so. Depending, that would be the second remark on what kind of cities we are talking about. York is, I'm sure, a wonderful place, but it is not the most important place in, on earth in terms of political cloud worldwide. So it may make a difference if that comes from the city of New York or from the city of Katz or, or, or a region. Um, so that would perhaps be part of the, the answer. Um, another answer would be that historically, this is nothing really new. I mean, there have been plenty of cities, particularly in the, in the uh, US American context that have had policies against apartheid, uh, against South Africa and very strong and operational policies in not engaging with uh, South Af apartheid South Africa uh, for, for, for a number of reasons. Um, and depending on the situation, that may of course be of interest. Again, China here, of course, being a different a different entity altogether. Um, and finally, I think part of the answer is already perhaps in the question itself. When 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 uh, it was made clear that there is a twinning of cities uh, going on, which seems to be at the core of the problem, which then perhaps is also some kind of the core of the solution, that it is not pitching York against China. It is perhaps asking York to engage with partner cities on the local level to discuss, is, to discuss issues of, of local concern um, and uh, keep it operational and possible in that 
that realm. I think this would be a realistic approach. Um, uh, other approaches might perhaps be wishful and idealistic, but not, not very realistic, if I might put it that way. It doesn't answer the question, but it gives some uh, elements, I think, on which one could rely or which one could use to work with. Uh, thank you. I wonder if I can come in now um, with a question from Stephen. So in your talk, Gerd, you talked about conflict between state and local government um, as a, a site of conflict. And this question is more about what happens when there is a conflict between civil society activism and the local authority. So the question is, could you say some more about city governance and civil society activism? in particular about local government that might have made a commitment to become a human rights city, but then takes a decision which appears to run counter to the commitment. And are there any mechanisms that you know about about how civil society might hold the political parties to account? Thank you for the, for the question again. Um, Civil society, of course, has in all the human rights cities that we can survey a most important role to play. Um, first of all, civil society in itself may be diverse. And I think what we see in human rights cities is usually driving forces that come from uh, civil society in the form of non-governmental organizations working mostly on specific topics around specific issues and, and driving an, an agenda, but it is often also connected to, uh, in the broadest sense, an educational or academic environment, if you would count that as civil society. And I think your work and cards are good examples as well, that uh, there is also this element of um, educational and academic entities forming part of civil society and being part of this of this process. So that would be perhaps the first remark that uh, civil society in itself may be a bit diverse and may then have also different needs and different approaches to the human rights cities idea. Um, the more idealistic world that I have tried to sketch in which civil society invites the governments of cities to do something and then it happens jointly is not the case. Uh, very often, and and uh, it could be a situation in which, uh, um, depending on electoral cycles and changing in local governments, actions are being taken which um, pose problems to civil society activism. I think one part of the solution is to ensure that human rights cities, as being human rights cities, have to have that space for civil society and have to have more space for civil society and perhaps even have to endure civil society that is acting stronger than in other places. I'm saying this because uh, in our city at the moment, it is nigh impossible to reach your workplace in the morning because we have the climate activists uh, that sort of glue themselves to the street every single morning, uh, which is a climate issue, but it's also a human rights issue. And is something in which I would say human rights city has to take a very careful approach to allow perhaps even for more of such protests than other cities do, which not all uh, people living in the city in this in this moment really would uh, would um, agree with. Um, in that sense, civil society is often the driving force of human rights cities and should be in the driving chair together with uh, with uh, governance structures. I think in Guts we have found a rather nice solution in having this advisory board in which you have representatives of city administration of all political parties and all segments of society uh, that have a forum to argue and to create possible solutions. I think these or similar institutions of institutionalized civil society participation and also civil society protection are of great importance and need to be constructed um, as a mechanism. The final part of that question is more tricky. Are there, should there be means to hold city governments accountable, uh, if I understood correctly? Um, 
that of course takes the you know, right cities idea to a level in which you create more specific rights holders and more specific duty bearers. Whereas very often in the city constructions that we see, engagement is one of mediation or one of discussion or one of joint engagement than of specific elements for holding duty bearers to account by essentially legal means. Um, personally, I would argue more for political processes of accountability than processes of accountability which are mirrored along the lines of judicial or other procedures. I do not think that human rights cities have or have yet strong mechanisms to provide in that sense, also because of what I tried to say also in my talk, that uh, we are only now moving towards more specific obligations, perhaps even legally enforceable obligations, and are more working with principles uh, than, than we do with uh, um, means that lead to direct accountability. So I would be also not necessarily disappointed, but perhaps cautious when it comes to the accountability question in human rights cities. Okay, the next question, it's another long one. The questions are coming in thick and fast now. Um, so the question is, in many cases of human rights city policy, it's difficult to distinguish individuals as in general citizens as a policy beneficiary. Many people think human rights is for someone else and not the general people. What should be pursued by the practical duty bearer, the state and the local government? And how much do you think the international organizations such as the UN and UNESCO um, is willing to support these movements? Two, two questions in, in that, starting perhaps with the role of international organizations. I think at least our perspective here has always been to create a close link between the global and the local. That's the whole point of the human rights cities idea in a way. And that also necessitates, I think, connecting um, international organizations with, uh, with uh, cities. I think it's a two-way approach. It, it flows from the international to the local, but it also goes the other way up. It goes from the local to the, to the global. Um, both of these ways, I think, are only being discovered as we speak and are not as forceful and strong as they perhaps are. Um, international organizations have begun in some areas to discover the importance of, of, of cities and uh, local places. Again, I think the climate debate here is, is, is at the forefront, much more perhaps than the human rights debate, um, in which um, not only international norms, but also international organizations as organizations connect with the local. But to me, the more important thing would be the next step in which the local, that is both the local governance structures, but also local individual initiatives can access international organizations more vividly. And that is not the case at the moment. Yeah? If you send a mayor to the Human Rights Council in Geneva, uh, nobody is quite sure what the place of that mayor would be and where the seat would be, and what the label would be, and how that would all work. So there's still a lot to be discovered, I think, uh, in, in, in the sense in, 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 this, in this connection. Um, human rights trickling down to the individual and the argument that human rights are always for somebody, for somebody else, I think the great strength of the human rights movement at the local level rests in the fact but also the challenge still rests in the fact that one can explain that human rights is something for everyday life. Uh, it's the bus line that I have tried to mention. It is not the usual talk that we have that human rights are um, a protective force against the most severe human rights abuses that we do not have in our city, or that uh, they are so elitist that I, as humble citizen, will never be affected by them, and they have no meaning for me. And I think the strength, but as I said, also the challenge in communication, it's also a challenge that we encounter again and again, lies in the fact to make this everyday aspect of human rights 
a visible thing for everyone. And I'm not saying that this is easy, and I'm not saying that we succeed very often with that, and other human rights cities perhaps the same, because very often you fall in the trap that you discuss the usual human rights violations and point towards places that are far away and have dramatic human rights violations and that this has nothing to do with us. So I think it's the strength, but also the challenge. And essentially to me, it's a communication challenge also to make people understand that this is connected to their everyday life. Thank you. I think that is a really good question because it is something we struggle with in York is to how to make it accessible. So it's not just an academic thing, but it's actually something that does belong to the people. So it's something we're constantly trying to work out. Yeah, um, Barry, I, I, do you want Sorry. Say one word on that, on, on that, on following up on that. I mean, our main, one of our main communication strategies here in Graz is, is an annual human rights report that sort of brings together, that, that wraps human rights problems into local issues and makes it clear that this is an issue, that you have a document that you can communicate, um, and that is um, a means that can be sort of regularly used and seen. But I'm all with you, Alison, that the success is limited. I mean, if, if you have a human rights report that essentially says this was a good year for human rights in the city, no journalist will show up, none. <laughs> there is no communication. Yeah. So there is a, a communication issue and a communication gap that I think we need to, to address much more, much more seriously. I don't think we've got that problem just at the moment, <laughs> to be honest, <laughs> which leads us nicely around. Do you want to ask the next question about the blue badge? Well, I wondered if I could just take uh, it a little bit further, actually, yeah. um, Alison and Gert, and um, because what we find locally is that it's easier for people to understand and engage with equalities. So they they can talk about equalities and the Equality Act and the protected characteristics and understand that. And I wonder if you've had any uh, any valuable experience to help us from Gratz about how you've been able to extend uh, understanding and awareness from equalities into human rights and um, particularly where the differences are as well as how they complement each other. Um, yeah, thank you, Marilyn. I, I take your point. I think um, one example that, that we have here that seems to operate um, and seems to, to function both operationally and in the perception is uh, an office for non-discrimination um, that works both for the for the city but also for the province, and that has sort of this this duality. It is a firm legal institution that looks and sounds and acts very much as if it is a proper office to which you can file proper complaints and you get some kind of proper answers and there is some kind of uh, legal quality to it. But it is also constructed more openly in that it's not necessarily based on specific non-discrimination laws. It's more a venue also to address equality or inequality situations, um, uh, and uh, which means both the access is easier and uh, the output is often not so much a, a legal accountability output, but more reporting on structures and trends and issues and problems. And that also connected with sort of some, some strong people working in that and it, it, it leads in a way to, to, to this being an interesting instrument in which I think you often see this combination of classic equality discrimination debates with a human rights element in which you have the human rights documents and texts that are being used to make the point in certain, in certain situations. Um, and I think that's perhaps one of the one of the successes uh, that that we have here, and that is also and that's what I mean is also perceived in the public. I think as a place to which you can reasonably go, and from which you get a result that would be, or should I say, culturally acceptable as well, more than just legally sound. Yeah without glorifying this because it, it still has it has limited limited uh, range but I think there are means and mechanisms for, for such a, a combination of what you said um thank you 
Thank you. I wonder if we should go straight to Emma's question, Alison, which I can read out. Um, so this is, is, is back to thinking about that national local relationship. Um, so there may be differing contexts and cultures in which human rights um, are, are made to establish a minimum level of, level of dignity. But how do you think different relationships between national level and more local governments affect the implementation of human rights on a local level? I was at some hustings this afternoon where there was lots of debate about we can't do much about that locally as politicians because of the national uh, the national situation. Um, I think there's there's of course a, a, um, a legal or administrative answer that needs to be given and that needs to be taken serious that you have very different setups of cities and regions in, in terms of how they are located legally in the multi-level governance structure. And um, I think we, we see this very often when we when we watch encounters of, of different cities and city administrators. The first challenge is to come to terms with the amount of autonomy or non-existing autonomy that the others have. And it usually takes a while for them to understand this setup. Uh, to also appreciate and understand what is possible and what is impossible. Uh, so there is, I think, this, this legal element which, which needs to be taken serious um, and which is also very often sort of a first response by my more loyally colleagues to say, this is a fantastic idea, but the cities can't do anything because there is that statute and that law and you have to do it like this and do it like that. And I think it has to be taken serious in a way. So that also means and the question that goes also to these different cultures and different different ways of implementing things, things will change from country to country and from region to region, depending on the setup that you have and that you cannot necessarily ignore. Um, and, and look for the kind of autonomy that you have in regions or in cities that allow for actual uh, for actual activities. The second answer to that is, and I've tried to highlight that in my talk, cities play very differently. Yeah? Some are very robust in doing what they do. San Francisco, strictly speaking, is not really allowed to integrate the CEDAW Convention into its ordinances. It does. Um, so there is a robustness of some places and that may be driven by different factors because cities, or at least some cities, have always been unruly places and some of them explore their history through the human rights cities idea, uh, in which some cities are perhaps simply more robust in putting things forward, which sounds like a good thing, but which of course depends very much on the electoral cycles and, and, and elections outcomes, because yeah? that comes and goes with the mayor's incentive to be active or, or less active. So there's also a danger in, in that. Um, but I think for some, the human rights cities idea as an idea also allows for that kind of robustness. And that's also what I meant when I said, it's not always about the law. Yeah? Sometimes it's about the language being used. Sometimes it's about the artworks being displaced in public places. Sometimes it's about how you construct the feeling and the life of the city more than uh, the legal elements. Um, and perhaps final comments on the cultural thing. I mean, one, one thing that is a bit, um, that has perhaps in the human rights movement gone a bit to the background is the, uh, the strong uh, importance of, of the different regions of the world having their human rights cities and their human rights approaches. We are moving a bit toward a situation in which much of the driving force is being done by European cities. And that, of course, brings with it the specific European understanding of what human rights are how they are implemented, protected, and promoted. Um, and we find it often difficult to hear the voices of other places. We have been trying to do this a lot and cooperate a lot with the um, African um, Academy for local, governments, for local Governments. And if you listen to, there's a fantastic uh, a group of female mayors being active in that field. And if you listen to this group, you get very different perspectives of what it means to be a human rights city yeah? from, a, from a cultural background. And uh, 
with all the importance of the European human rights cities, we are moving a bit into a direction of a sort of a European Eurocentric approach to, to what a human rights city has to be. And that, that, that's just, it's just triggered by the remark of the different cultures of human rights in, in which human rights cities reside. Thank you. Okay, um, I'll just ask another question from an anonymous attendee. To what extent is it important to have an entity that articulates the variety of citizen collective initiatives, given the diversity of values and objectives among them? Do you understand that question? I think I understand the question. Um... <laughs> Good. You have an answer to the question. <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm not sure I do. Um, there is some inclusiveness, I think, in the idea of a human rights city, in which it needs to take on board very different approaches to what it means to be a human rights city. But I think that has two consequences. One is you enter, of course, in what you always end up with human rights, and that is contradictions of human rights or or uh, human rights that uh, sort of um, clashes of human rights concerns that need to be resolved. Um, because you have different stakeholders with different, with different problems that all can be accommodated in human rights. We had a fantastic debate here in the city of Graz about the noise that you make when you are skateboarding. <laughs> um, and there was a demand by young skateboarders that a specific public place should be open for skateboarders because this is youth participation in public space and so on and so forth. And you had elderly residents living in this place saying the noise is unbearable. What about my human rights not to hear this noise? Um, I think that is inevitable. I also think it's not overly dramatic because what it does mean is that you have to use the means that you use always in human rights to resolve these issues proportionality considerations, necessity considerations, the whole jurisprudence of the European Court of Human Rights up and down to resolve conflicts of different groups that all have a stake at the local level. And I think that can be done. And I think there are also quite some examples of that. The other answer perhaps is a bit more difficult that um, Local initiatives can, of course, be used for a variety of things, some of which are in line with human rights and some are not. Uh, you have a number of US cities that strongly believe that carrying weapons openly and giving weapons to small children is a fantastic thing, an expression of great liberty and human rights. Um, engaging with sort of the fringes um, is much more problematic, I would say. Um, and it would also mean some more robustness by human rights defenders to consider that some claims on the local level are perhaps not in line with what human rights law as read through the international human rights law as it stands allows for. And that is a real conflict. I don't know if I understood the question and I don't know if I answered the question. I think you did pretty well, thank you. Um, the, the next question is from Carol, and it's a, it's a very particular one um, uh, about compensation. So this is what, what do you do um, and, and when will the ombudsman and government that have been found to be treating their citizens with injustice pay adequate compensation to match the injury suffered? Uh, I'm sure you'll get the, the sense of it. Um, about justice through the compensation system? Um, again, I think that human rights cities deal with that problem differently, uh, depending also on the kind of traditions that exist with regard to uh, compensation means and compensation mechanisms, and particularly with regard to the, to the institution of the ombudsperson which I think has an important role to play here, or perhaps even other means of mediation being followed by compensation. I think there is no single answer to that. Um, 
as it might not be the most pressing needs in some circumstances and might be a very pressing need in other circumstances. Um, I'm not sure if I'm really able to answer the question because it serves into a field that is that has more to do with the classic setup of whether or not these compensation institutions exist, up to including uh, the court system, um, because it gives human rights. It is, of course, also a very distinct spin as uh, sort of replicating something which usually exists elsewhere in national courts or with uh, with national ombudspersons and uh, and so on um what we see more perhaps is the kind of of mediation approach that um a kind of neighborhood approach that argues for solving problems and settling problems as they emerge i mean particularly in the right to housing and in other places in which uh, financial compensation is perhaps not the first the first problem um and have a second layer of of uh, court decisions on on compensation then so it's uh, it's an issue that goes perhaps beyond or is slightly distinct also from the from the human rights based approach to governance but is more a rule of law problem uh, for the local level thank you Alison, do you want to take Sue's question? So, yeah, so how crucial is it that we stay true to Eleanor's universal declaration of human rights and challenge current government changes to reduce our human rights? Bouncing around then on my question thing. Did you get that? Um, yes, Eleanor Roosevelt, UDHR. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, always read Eleanor Roosevelt. She's fantastic to start with. Um, secondly, uh, UDHR and the importance of UDHR, I think, is is unquestioned. Um, also for the uh, for the idea of the human rights cities, I would say that as I've tried to say in my talk, really the human rights cities are some kind of rediscovering the true nature, or at least part of the true nature of the UDHR and what it means. Um, that uh, the developments of the seventies, eighties, nineties was a very much state centered creation of human rights systems, which is fine and fantastic and necessary. Uh, but there is a bit of rediscovering uh, the, the broader nature of the UDHR by exploring them on the, on the local level. So importance, importance, yes, but importance also holding governments and holding local governments and, and also national governments to account. Um, because by using the things that have been built on the UDHR, and that is by understanding the human rights based approach in a way that we are talking about duty bearers and right holders after all, uh, that there are ways and means to um, to implement and to realize human rights based on UDHR in a meaningful way, in a combination of the global and the local. Um, and in that sense, using all of international human rights law, because that is in a way the downside, of course, of relying on loose principles on the domestic level, which many human rights cities do, ours included, by simply invoking the UDHR as a set of principles and then ignoring that the set of principles has been translated into an international human rights system that does, surprise, surprise, include the European Court of Human Rights that has judgments that are also relevant for the national level and for the local level. Yeah, um, and and we should ac acknowledge. Um, I mean, we're coming towards the end, uh, but uh, there was a, a, an earlier question from that person that we jumped over to get to one that matched the one that we were asking you, uh, and it's disappeared from the screen now. But uh, it is a very specific one uh, from Sue. Uh, we have a local issue of disabled people being excluded from the city centre because of their um, a, a, a badge that they have a certificate if they're eligible that they can get that would enable them to move into air and areas that uh, wouldn't be able to otherwise. But that right has been withdrawn locally. Um, and she was asking if you have any comments on that or know of other 
cities that are excluding disabled people in this way or who are enabling disabled people to continue to access their city. I think the clash between disabled people's rights and other issues like counter-terrorism, climate change, whatever. I, I, it's difficult for me to comment because I don't know the York situation. I find it somewhat surprising. Of course, uh, the way this being framed here looks uh, as a very clear-cut case in which uh, there is quite some human rights issue attached to that. It's not. It's not only discriminatory exclusion. It's. 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 Uh, it's also why would you why would you not support uh, vulnerable persons and 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 have their access to the to the city center? So I. I find it. A bit, I find it interesting. Let's put it that way. Uh, and and it seems to be a big issue for you at the at the moment. Um, I cannot offer any any comments really on the on on the specific issue of persons with disabilities and and local human rights other than playing again that generally using the disability rights convention is of course an option that some regions and, and cities have been dealing with very specifically uh, by arguing through the um through the disability rights convention um we have in a way sort of the uh um, a similar problem there because in our country we've, we we struggle to implement or we struggle to create national action plans on persons with disabilities based on the on the disability rights conventions and that's also a big issue for the for the local uh for the local level we we do have in in the region here uh, a, a monitoring body that does monitor the um, um disabled persons rights convention regionally locally regionally which uh, i think persons working in the field find very helpful uh, and find very valuable so it's a monitoring body that essentially puts recommendations to uh, to the respective authorities so i don't know if anything like this exists in, in york or in the york region uh, as a channel in which you can more directly invoke uh, invoke uh, the, uh, the problem we had uh, a somewhat similar but different exclusion problem for some point here, which was about the exclusion of persons begging in the streets uh, from the city center. Um, and that was resolved not only here, but in other places, quite forcefully at the end by a ruling of the Constitutional Court, which reconciled the needs to uh, manage public space with uh, the rights of persons that demonstrate publicly their poverty. So this is of course a very it's a similar it's it's a it's a it's a dissimilar situation of course, uh, but it's just to flag that um, our solution at the end was to go to the constitutional court and have a judgment all the way up to convince the local government that something is fundamentally wrong with such exclusionary policies. I do not know if there is any way to compare such situations, but uh, for us it took the legal route because there was no way to negotiate or mediate that in light of the political situation. Thank you. But as Thank I said, you. I don't know the York situation. So I yeah, yeah, no, that's that's very helpful. Sounds like a bit of a costly uh, solution as well, though. Um, I wonder if I could just read out the final uh, comments rather than question, Alison, if that's OK, because it's from one of our international participants. Uh, and we got an email earlier today and we will reply to it, Joshua. Um, but it's a place uh, from which my daughter has recently returned from Hawaii, if I'm if I understand it right. It says Aloha Mahalo. So sorry for if my pronunciation isn't right. We appreciate the conversation and look forward to continued discussion and actions around municipal multilateralism for human rights promotion and protection. What what better way to end? The question and answer and thanks to everybody that sent in questions. My thanks to to Marilyn and, and Alison for moderating that and obviously good also for your for your responses. Um, I, I mean you've touched on so many issues that are relevant to uh, the kind of everyday work that we've been doing on human rights in the city but I'd like to hand over to uh, Stephen Pittam who is the chair of the York Human Rights City Network 
um, to give a final vote of thanks. Thank you. And yes, Paul, haven't we heard uh, an awful lot tonight that is relevant to us? And so <laughs> that's really wonderful. So a big thank you, um, Gert, for, for, for sharing your breadth and depth of experience with us tonight. I think that's come through so strongly. And I think this is the fifth lecture that we've organized uh, from the York Human Rights City Network. And it stands out for me because it's the first which is really focused on what we are, um, a human rights city trying to implement um, the, the, the common values of human rights uh, in all that we do in, in our city. So it's been so good to hear about that and to hear something about the story, which many of us probably are not so familiar with about the the last 25 years and the way in which human rights cities have, have developed. It's great for us to be able to see that what we're doing here is part of, part of that community, the wider community, um, particularly for us, I think, uh, in Europe, um, but also globally as well. And that's really important for us. And I love the way in which you talked about human rights cities as laboratories for testing or implementing innovative approaches to promote human rights. You know, words like innovation, um, pragmatic creativity and pluralism. These are all issues which, of course, um, are really important and ones which we want to promote here uh, in terms of, of York. And to hear more about the growing interest in the international human rights framework uh, for thinking about how to make human rights uh, relevant to, at a local level. Um, so it's so important for us to actually feel that we are part of this wider movement and to hear your experience on that. So thank you very much for that. I think it was also encouraging thing for me, and I think this is partly relates to our relationship with Graz, that um, that in terms of the core elements you you referred to, um, we we to some extent have them. Uh, insofar that we have a commitment, which many of the institutions and the council and civil society and the police and the health service and others uh, signed up to in 2017, which allowed us to start this journey of uh, uh, and a journey to become a human rights city. Um, so we have the commitment. We 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 try to work on the basis of the Graz um, Council of of creating a human rights and equality board, and I think that's work in progress. You know, uh, you you've heard tonight that we do have some difficulties in York at the moment in terms of interpreting human rights um, and this relationship between civil society and. The, the, the political leaders of the council and the officers of the council is one that we're working on and working through hopefully to make um, a, a more constructive relationship as we as, as we move forward. And then, of course, you referred to the tool that we have of our annual um, human rights indicator report, which, uh, as Paul has mentioned, we are just about on the, to, to release the latest version of that. And that's great that we're working on that. Um, so, um, you know, we've got a lot to thank Gratz for, and we're delighted that you've been able to join us uh, online tonight. And we really look forward to the time that we can welcome you to our city um, in person and, you know, to, to, to take forward that relationship that we, we, we've developed. So a very big thank you from the York Human Rights City Network. And uh, we look forward to keeping in touch. And we will use this talk, uh, I know, um, for a lot of people who weren't able to be with us tonight, but we will, uh, with your permission, um, make sure that this is um, uh, well disseminated here for us as well. So thank you, Gert. Um, and um, yeah, good wishes to Graz. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all. It was a great pleasure for me and a great honor. Thank you.